What's up, everyone? Welcome into the All-22 NFL Podcast. You got Chris and Ray. The season's about to begin. We're excited to jump into it. Ray, we got some games coming up, starting with the Ravens and Chiefs. I'm pretty pumped about this. We got some exciting matchups. We have potentially Nate Wiggins versus Xavier Worthy. We have Kingsley Sumo- Sumotai uh, going against... You know, Sumamati, some- yeah. But yeah. Okay. O- Odafe Owe, right? Uh, J- maybe we get to see some Jaden Hicks. So starting off with an absolute banger... And it only gets really better from there. You getting excited? Yeah, I can't. It still doesn't really feel like it's here yet, but it's it's here. Like that. That's it. I mean, there's like one more day to draft on the platform, and then the season's here. So I'm setting my depth chart. Um, I, I had a couple, you know, preseason waiver wire pickups. Um, one of which was a kicker, but you know, that's neither here nor there. There's still people too. But yeah, season's here. Long off season, and and we're back. Uh, I actually think the Chiefs are going to roll. I'm not sure we, really, we like had a segment on this game or not, but I just something tells me like I think the Chiefs are just going to roll tomorrow night, and I could be dead wrong, but it's just the way I see it. I think I think the Ravens' new coordinators kind of lost some key pieces here and there. I just I don't know, man. I, th- I think I think Chiefs roll. Okay, Rasheed Rice right. is somehow playing, just like avoiding consequences and is just playing. That's another thing. Um, but yeah, I think I think the line, you know. I think the offensive line kind of holds up for the Chiefs on, on the interior, especially. And I think that's all Mahomes needs. Yeah, well, I'm just hoping I can see it. I had uh, a little eye thing going on. So um haven't been able to see it. Can barely see you as we're having this conversation, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna work through this, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's uh, hopefully who needs nonverbal cues, you know, who needs that? Just <laughs> exactly. Uh, but obviously I'm excited for Friday, which is the Packers Eagles in Sao Paulo. And it's really gonna be for me in that game, like the weapons versus the young DBs in Philly, right? Like what are those DBs going to become? Is that defensive line in Philly going to kind of put the pieces together? Is Jordan Davis going to become something, right? I think the Packers offense might be able to take advantage a little bit more than the Eagles offense will. So super excited about that one. We have Titans bears coming up this weekend, right? Which is going to be Caleb in Rome, right? And the the new bears offense, but it's also like JC Latham and Devondre sweat and the, the new, kind of offensive line of the Titans and the new trenches, right, of the Titans with the new coaching. I'm pretty excited for both sides of that matchup. We have Steelers-Falcons, and if I told you a year ago the quarterbacks of that game were going to be Russell Wilson and Kirk Cousins, you would have no idea which team or who's playing for who. So that's kind of cool. And then I think just Monday, Jets 49ers. That's going to be a fantastic game. Hopefully we get to see more than four plays of Aaron Rodgers this season, right, and then uh, see what that new – contract does with uh brandon Ayuk. yeah no lots of exciting matchups the nfl knows what they're doing they with with, with their week one matchups get uh you know get some intriguing storylines there Aaron Rodgers being from california of course and that's his childhood team and the jets have the hype surrounding them this year with kind of like just hitting the reset button since they couldn't do anything last year once rogers went down so a lot of a lot of really good intriguing matchups and then there's like the hidden storylines too like Oh, Tyler Guyton looked like the best offensive tackle in the class in the preseason, but okay, here comes Miles Garrett. So, like, let's see what that was really worth all summer, right? Um, so, any game that you turn on, there's lots of things to watch, and you should have some all 22 fantasy implications for any of those games, uh, assuming you have a, a, a balanced roster and didn't lean heavy too often on one team versus another. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Week one is here. We got college football, we got pro football. So, um, what's the stat? I think there's now football on every Saturday and Sunday for uh, until like Valentine's Day or something. So, yeah, enjoy it. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Today, we're going to be doing a little exercise, right? You likely already have drafted your team. You already have the guys you know, on your roster that you'll likely begin the season with. But if we were to identify some under-the-radar players that we think are going to have breakouts this year that maybe you could get for cheap. If you haven't drafted yet, you could probably get them late. But if you did, right, these might be prime trade candidates that you can get late or for cheap, uh, and you can offer something a little less, right, than what we think they're probably worth. So we're going to call out some of those guys. We're also going to talk about some deep cuts. So deep cuts to me is probably a guy that you can get in free agency. You could just go and pick him up. You have until tomorrow uh, at game time, you know, for the players playing Thursday to go get those guys. You can add guys over the weekend if they haven't played yet. So these might be guys that you want to add to your roster because we think that they might have their, you know, their breakout season. So 
Right. I'm going to start it off with the quarterback position. And again, quarterback's a little bit tricky because there's only 32 of them and everybody knows everything about every single one. So I could say any name here and it's not going to sound like I'm, you know, doing any anything magical calling out a guy. I'm, not, I'm just going to say it's Trevor Lawrence to me is the under the radar. And the reason I can say Trevor Lawrence is actually an under the radar guy is because I've done several startup drafts this year and have seen him gone between rounds 10 and 15, right? Most quarterbacks are going round one. So if a guy is going around 10, 15, he's either the last team picking starting quarterback or he's somebody's backup, right? So if Trevor Lawrence is a backup quarterback in your league, that's a prime target to go get. And not only is he going undervalued in drafts, but he really hasn't reached the ceiling. I feel like what we're experiencing is kind of what happened with Matthew Stafford early in his career, right? He went to a team that was not really built in a way to lead him to success right away. And it took a few years for him to really get going. And he was always good, but he never was a top five quarterback in the NFL, right? But then things started to you know, come together and pieces started to come together. And all of a sudden, Matthew Stafford became a really solid quarterback. I feel like we're experiencing that with Trevor Lawrence now. He still hasn't had an 80 graded season yet, right? It's it's been low 70s and then but it's incrementally gotten better. I think last year was close to 77, and I think this is the year we get in that 80s. There's coaching stability now. I think Brian Thomas Jr. looks like the best receiver that Trevor Lawrence has ever played with. So for me, that's a guy that I'm going to go get and say, "All right, either I'm going to put him on my bench and you know, just if it works out, it works out. Great. And if not, like, I think I feel pretty good about Trevor Lawrence being my starting quarterback this year. If you ask me about my deep cut, it gets a little bit more intense. I have to really reach for a deep cup at quarterback, and I'm going to do that here. But what if Kirk Cousins comes back and isn't isn't healthy? What if he comes back and he's rusty and the Falcons get off to the slow start that nobody's expecting them to, right? Everybody thinks that they're going to come out hot. They have all these weapons. They have a great O-line. And Cousins is a you know a perfect game manager. But what if that doesn't happen, right? Is there a chance that at some point this season we see Michael Penix? And would anybody be shocked if the gunslinger Michael Penix adds some excitement to the Atlanta Falcon season towards the end of the season if it doesn't go as planned, right? I think there's probably a 10% chance that happens. But if that opportunity does present itself for Michael Penix later in the year, I think it's going to be something everybody's talking about and everybody's going to be excited to see. And again, he can just go out and be a gunslinger and have fun if he's in that situation. So that's going to be my deep cut. Again, quarterback can't, can't go too deep. But uh, what do you think of my guys? Yeah, I think the thing is you look at the style of receivers or offense that they're in, and Trevor Lawrence has not had someone as dangerous as Brian Thomas Jr. Forget about how raw he probably is and what he has to learn and the route tree that he has to develop. Lawrence hasn't had a player who is as dangerous on any single given play as Thomas is in his entire Jacksonville career. So what that can do for him this season is what I'm most looking forward to watching. Um, like you mentioned, if he's your starter in all 22, you probably were picking like eighth or ninth and grabbed like a Micah Parsons or a Miles Garrett at the back end of the first round and then got your quarterback later on and are kind of taking advantage of that opportunity there. So you're hoping he can give you kind of like that top five or six grade despite the much later draft position. And it's possible that he does that. But I think if he does, it's because of kind of the threat that opens up the rest of the offense from someone like Brian Thomas Jr. just being on the field. And that's something you'll probably see the benefits of probably like October onward. Once Thomas Jr. does that, you know, once or twice or, you know, three times in the first month of the season and kind of makes everybody respect that part of his game. That's when I think you can maybe start to see things open up more in the Jacksonville offense. And with uh, the Falcons, Michael Penix, I mean, that's a, that's as good of a dice roll as any, I guess. He had the big receivers at, at Washington with Roman Dunze. He's got uh, Drake London and Kyle Pitts in Atlanta. If he were to see the field, a strong running game, and he's indoors, that's 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 pretty much fits what Penix brings to the table to a T. Uh, you know, health permitting, he's going to throw downfield. That's what he does best, and he's got the size and weapons for it. So, yeah, it's as good of a dice roll as any. All right, Ray, can you jump into running backs now? 
Yeah, and that's pretty awful. Like, I mean, I, I get that quarterback is tough because everybody knows everything about the quarterbacks, right? But so are running backs because they've been talked about all off season. So it's hard to be like, oh, here's a sleeper and here's a deep cut when it's, okay, who's going to get the most volume? And while all 22 is different, we still beat these guys to death just with discussions all off season. So like, does Joe Mixon count? Sure, yeah. I think Joe Mixon counts. So I, mean, I said Trevor Lawrence. So you said ahead. Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. So I'm going to say Joe Mixon. And if you just, again, look back, going back to 2022, I mean, the, the, the Texans offense overall, just schematically made Damian Pierce look like a stud in 2022 as a rookie. And just there's a different talent level when you're talking about Joe Mixon versus someone like Damian Pierce. And when you look at Cincinnati, it felt like they kind of had their best offensive line last year. And as a unit, they were still 23rd in run blocking in the entire league. He's never had an adequate blocking uh, or a good uh, just running game in, in Cincinnati as a whole. No good blocking for him. And so while Houston wasn't much better, they're way more balanced than they have been previously with the weapons that they've added at receiver. Uh, that offense really caught fire at the end of last season off the back of CJ Stroud. And now you're adding a piece at running back that adds talent or brings talent to the table that they didn't have before. I think that's a real synergistic relationship there. And I think the scheme overall, like, like I said before is helpful or geared towards helping running backs, um, find open space after one cut. So for Mixon, that's something he's never had before in his career. So while we're not talking about someone that you're probably going to hold on to for three years, I think at running back, given his age, just for this season, I think Joe Mixon is in for a big year. A lot of the arguments you hear for standard fantasy will apply here uh, when it comes to Mixon's performance in 2024. So I really like Joe Mixon a lot. Okay. And if you want to give you my deep cut, which is kind of, you know, it's, I guess it's standard for running back deep cut. It's kind of a cop out, but I think it makes the most sense. And that's Rico Dowdle, who just this week has again you've kind of heard out of out of Dallas that he is now the number one back in Dallas which has always been the case all summer but you know because you know Jerry Jones just loves him some Ezekiel Elliott we didn't hear about it but throughout training camp this entire time Rico Dattle has been clearly more explosive uh, having more big plays than than Zeke side by side there really hasn't been any comparison but the reason this is a deep cut is because a Rico Dattle has a history of injuries and has never really been able to stay healthy for a full season with a decent workload and you still just can't fully trust the organization because Jerry Jones plays favorites. And that situation in Dallas is just one where it's like our coach is able to tap Zeke on the shoulder and say, no, you are not going into the game. You're not getting on the field right now. This is Dowdle series. This it's third and two, but we want Dowdle in the game now. And, and that's going to be it because Zeke had seniority in this locker room for the longest time. Zeke, if he wanted to get in the game, he was going in the game and Mike McCarthy was not telling him no. This is back in 2022. Has that changed? I don't know. We all know he's one of Jerry's favorites and that's just something we have to wait and see. But overall in Dallas, you added Cooper Beebe who looks like a lock now at center. He's a people mover. Uh, we talked about Tyler Guyton looking a lot better this off season. And so they're kind of getting back to that old Dallas offensive line that gave them this solid reputation in the first place that they really haven't lived up to in the last few years, but they've kind of made steps in that direction this off season. I think that all comes together and helps the running game in 2024. And you just hope Dowdle is the one that actually receives those carries and is able to take advantage of it. What does that mean for my Deuce Vaughn shares? So here's the thing about Deuce Vaughn. I think it all comes down to whether you're talking about Deuce Vaughn or you're talking about someone like Cavante Turpin. It's just a matter of is the coaching staff willing to be creative with them and give them the ball in clutch situations during the regular season. In the summer, in training camp, they draw up some great-looking stuff. In preseason, they get the ball and they just fly, and it looks really good. Deuce Vaughn this preseason actually looked really strong running between the tackles, which is obviously something that most people don't expect from him given his size and his stature. But – their success is all just predicated upon whether the coaching staff actually is creative enough to utilize them in space as opposed to just talking about it. But then when things kind of get tough and crunch time, reverting back to their 2005 ways, which is really the knock on Mike McCarthy dating back to his days in Green Bay is 
He's not necessarily someone that's going to push the envelope schematically uh, or, or do any anything exotic or value added schematically to get athletes in space and, you know, just kind of put the defense in some serious conflict. That's not what they do. He's more about sound fundamental football. And that doesn't always work with guys like Deuce Vaughn or Cavante Turpin. So does he come out of his shell given he's on a, you know, the final year of his deal. He's kind of a lame duck coach. Everybody knows what's at stake in Dallas. They have to make at least the conference championship game where they're pretty much starting over. Or does that make him again, just kind of close up shop and do what, you know, revert back to what he knows best we really don't know. And that's what kind of makes this a deep cut overall is because you don't know exactly what they're going to do in Dallas and what that's going to look like. But the potential is there if they do open things up for guys that are not just names that are not just favorites that are not just old timers in that locker room to actually flourish. Sure. And I mean, I, I love the Joe Mixon pick as well. And I actually have a player on that offensive line that I'm going to be talking about later, but I'll save that for later. And I'll jump into receiver. Now I have a couple guys here and, I'll be honest, I don't feel great about him, but receiver is similar, right? It's fantasy football 101. Everybody knows everyone. So I wanted to go a little bit deeper. And I think somebody that has gotten a lot of hype this offseason has been Khalil Shakir. But I do think that there's there, it's warranted, right? Uh, he's got the body type route running ability that works really well in the All-22 game. Those types of receivers tend to be a little bit more sound in what they do. And there's a lot less boomer bust in their game. So I like that about Khalil Shakir. People forget that last year he also finished with a 75.5 grade to finish the year. And most of that came, most of that upside came towards the end of the year. He was playing a lot more snaps and he did extremely well. Uh, besides that, right? The vacancy of Stefan Diggs is going to open up so much more opportunity for young receivers like uh, Shakir here. So I just think it's a no brainer situation for a receiver to step in and be successful. I think the other situation that is a no brainer is somebody in Los Angeles with the chargers. And this is going to be my deep cup. And this is the complete opposite end of the spectrum, but is there a world where Simi, Simi, Simi Fahoko? Oh gosh. Fahoko. I'm just going to talk about it because I fall in love with tall, big Stanford receivers every single time. Uh, if you heard me talk about J.J. Arcega-Whiteside back in the day, you know that. Um, but this preseason, he absolutely feasted against competition. And most of the time when you see players go out in the preseason and just dominate, it's usually because those are starting receivers that shouldn't really be playing all that much preseason snaps, but they do. And when they do, they dominate, right? Fioco did that. And when he was on the field, he had seven catches, 170 yards, touchdown, and a 90.4 grade in the preseason. Again, it's preseason. You can't read too much into it. But what if I told you that the other guy that's the starter at the position in Quentin Johnston was awful in the preseason and finished with a 56, something like that overall grade in the preseason? I think that Mike Williams role is open. And those are the only two guys that really fill the body type skill set. And if you were to ask me watching the preseason, which one looked more likely to be successful, my boy from Stanford looks pretty darn good. Yeah, I guess I'm going to stick to my my original wide receiver projections if that's the case, because uh, I'm not jumping on the Simi Fajoko bandwagon. I'm just I'm just <laughs> not doing it. Uh, this is a I, this is your this is your 12 team league where uh, it's your eighth receiver, and you're just you know you're having some fun. Yeah, sure. Get your eighth offensive tackle before you get your eighth wide receiver, please, on this platform. Um, I think if that's the case, I think Jim Harbaugh just gives the ball to that 300-pound fullback that he announced <laughs> top the depth chart the other day before he gives Simi Fajoko like nine targets in a football game. Um, but he could be a monster blocker, and he's big, and maybe that's what gets him high grades in Los Angeles. Uh, sometimes trying to make sense of anything involving Jim Harbaugh is just an exercise in futility because it's Jim Harbaugh, but I am still not at all buying your Simi Fajoko argument. I'm just not going to do it out of principle. If, if absolutely nothing else, uh, Khalil Shakir possible. I, I always wonder then, is this just going to be one of those, uh, really f tight end force fed, uh, passing games at this point as a result, which, which I guess it could be, I'm interested in seeing what Buffalo does, uh, stylistically on offense, it's possible after three games that it is obvious that Khalil Shakir is taking a big step forward. If not, we're probably uh, looking then again at a more tight end oriented passing game, which is fine given what they've invested in the position. Uh, I just, I'd rather see what, 
what happens the first couple of games of the year first and kind of see what they look like. Okay. And that's also me. You- that's that's also code for I didn't really like Khalil Shakir coming out into the draft. I know a lot of people did. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't either, but I think that like even if it's tight end heavy, right? Like there needs to be some this is Josh Allen. This is a five thousand yard a year quarterback. He's gonna be throwing the ball around. So even if you have Dalton Kincaid with twelve hundred yards, you need somebody at the receiver position to be doing something. And I don't think Keon Coleman, I, I don't think either of us think Keon Coleman is a guy that's gonna step out there day one and be a stud. So why not Khalil Shakir? But why don't you tell me who Curtis Samuel year? That's why, because it's the Curtis Samuel year. I've been this hearing you say that for five Samuel. years. And I'm sick of it. If they ever I just gave quit him this the podcast, ball, it would be it would be the Curtis Samuel year. If they ever just gave him the ball. Who do you have at tight end, Ray? Tight end. So tight end is another really really tough position. By the way, I actually wrote in my notes that this is BS that you gave me these positions to do because it's really hard because. I think the conversation about tight end is how there's only like five good ones in the league. And now you're telling me to find a sleeper and a deep cut. So uh, I have, them. I'm just, I'm you just focusing take a break on if you want. No, no, I, I got it. I got it. So look, <laughs> look, quit complaining. I'll just say Trey McBride is not a sleeper. Okay. He, you could call him maybe a breakout candidate, but he's not a sleeper. Okay. This guy if it, it, probably top six tight ends in the platform uh, being drafted. So that's not a sleeper, just good situation in Arizona. Um, all signs point to a breakout. So, I had to look at rookies when it came to sleepers slash deep cuts. And so I'm going to talk about my boy, your boy, Theo Johnson. Of course, I'm going to talk about Theo Johnson. Athletic freak has all the triangle numbers, Uh, you know, had some flashes in the preseason, but it's more so because we know Malik neighbors is great. But when I look at the rest of that offense, I think Jalen Hyatt is just an untrustworthy target consistently. He may get you some deep passes here or there, but I don't see him as a consistent threat. I don't see him as a consistent player. Wandale, more, uh, Wandale Robinson is kind of like a gadget guy too. He's not necessarily your traditional wide receivers. I think when you look at this offense, you're still looking at or looking for a true number two passing off option on the offense. And at I guess is going to be the tight end and neighbors will open things up for him. So it's more so an athletic player getting opportunities in space as a result of Malik neighbors opening up some space for him and nobody else in the room being able to kind of be a value added player to take advantage of what Malik neighbors is going to do for everybody else. And also because again, just looking at the quarterback, it's probably better to kind of have some of those uh, quicker passes uh, either on the outs or over the middle to a tight end and a bigger target just to kind of protect the ball. I think that's what the giants offense is going to move towards. And that kind of plays into Theo Johnson's hands. I think, especially as the year goes on outside of that, I can kind of say the same thing about Ben Sinat as it relates to just an athletic tight end who's going to have a, a good opportunity there if they have one very good receiver on offense and he has an opportunity to maybe step up and be the second option in the passing game by the end of the year. So I think it kind of goes for both of them. But yeah, tight end is not a deep position in the league. They're very hard to find because you have to be such a complete player. And I'm sure you're probably going to mention your guy who used to play for the Seahawks. You bring him up every time you mention tight ends on this podcast. But uh, yeah, if if I'm in search of a tight end and I don't have a name guy, I'm just looking at the young players at the position because those are the ones who, you know, they're the next men up. And I think these two guys are candidates to be, you know, long-term good players at the position for the next, you know, better part of the next decade. They're both definitely intriguing. I mean, I think Theo Johnson has a great opportunity to be successful in that New York Giants offense. I do like Daniel Bellinger quite a bit, and I think that he's being completely underrated at this point because I do think he's more of that traditional tight end that can be on the field for, you know, most snaps where Theo Johnson, what I saw, looks like more of your receiving tight end. Also on top of that, don't know if it was Drew Aller or if it was him, but there was a lack of kind of... Okay. It seemed like there was a a lack of uh, (laughs) connection there. And, you know, obviously we hope that doesn't carry forward in the NFL. Uh, Ben Sinat, yes, he has an awesome opportunity to be successful there in Washington. I know that uh, all 22 Bobby is in love with that guy. So we'll have to wait and see. But yes, Will Disley is the obvious choice for the deep cut. The just most consistently high graded under the radar tight end in all 22 history. 
going to the Chargers in that run heavy offense. I think it's going to be fantastic. Let me move to tackle. And I'm going to start off with a Green Bay Packer that wasn't even a starter at the, the beginning of the season last year. And I think that's something I always look for, right? Who was somebody that didn't have a full off season as a starter before going into the season, then showed up and showed out and did pretty well, right? And that's Rashid Walker. That's going to be the right tackle for the Packers this year. He fin- finished last year in his last 10 weeks with eight weeks of green or blue grading. That means he had over 60 grading in eight of his last 10 weeks. And to, to be honest, if you look at it right, the majority of them are well over 60. And again, one in the blue means it was over 80. That's really good for you know a guy that, again, wasn't part of the starting roster in the offseason. So this year, he's going to have a chance to have a full offseason as the starter. He's sliding into an offensive line that should be more stable this year. There was constant change on that Green Bay offensive line last year, which is one of the reasons Jordan Love started off so slow. This year, I expect them to have some stability in the beginning, at least. And hopefully that does a lot for Rashid Walker. Deep cut. It's not necessarily a huge deep cut in terms of a guy you haven't heard of before. It's not Simi Fioko or Will Disley, but it is Abraham Lucas, who is the guy that Ray and I just can't quit on for some reason. And I, in particular, am just not ready to do that yet. Um, If you watched his film in 2022, you would have thought that you were seeing the next breakout offensive tackle to enter the NFL, and it's been nothing but injury since then. Uh, Saying that, right, if this guy comes back healthy, that is a new, you know, new coaching staff, uh, kind of a new way to do things. They have better receiving weapons now with uh, another year of uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba into that offense with Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf again, right? And you think that there's going to be some continue continuity on that offensive line. They actually added a center, uh, Connor Williams from, from the Dolphins. So it gets a little bit better. That unit gets a little bit better. And if Abraham Lucas, who is not going to be starting the season as the starter, which is one of the reasons I have him as a deep cut, he is not going in as a starter because of the injuries. If he comes back at any point this season and plays football, he's a guy that I want to take a shot on. And even if it's not, the beginning of this year, maybe it's towards the end of the year that you actually get something from him. I think it's a long-term investment that you're going to be happy to take the the risk on because you know that if he comes back, he's going to be a starter for you in all 22. What new offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb does on offense, Abraham Lucas fits very well. It's just a matter of he's healthy enough to get on the field and actually do it. As for Rasheed Walker, that's somebody who could have been a first-round pick if nobody had told him he could have been a first round pick while he was still in school, think about it. It'll make sense. Okay. All right. I like it. I guess you agree with me. So give me your guards. Guards. Uh, this probably is not a shocker to you, um, but uh, I'll go with guards. Uh, I mentioned this on the previous episode and sleeper Will Hernandez. A lot of it you might've heard uh, during the guard episode, but his last two seasons have actually been, seen a higher uptick in grading after pretty much three years in just the absolute abyss where he was playing pretty much below replacement level at guard. And I had mentioned this before, but the Cardinals now have competency at some points on their offense, right? You have Kyler back, you have Marvin Harrison Jr. I mentioned Trey McBride earlier this episode. He's ready to break out. Michael Wilson's a good complimentary piece at receiver too that isn't getting talked about anymore because of the addition of Marvin Harrison Jr., but I think that only makes him better as well. So I think this is the season to where you kind of had a good start to Will uh, Hernandez's career. Then you had three years of subpar grading and just honestly not someone you want to roster in this platform, let alone start. Uh, But then two seasons of improvement back into high 60s grading here. I think he can eclipse the 70s here and kind of be a a back end, maybe low 20s guard, like 22nd, 24th ish guard in the league, uh, grade wise for this season. Maybe someone has like your guard two or guard three in all 22. And if he doesn't eclipse that mark, honestly, I'm just blaming Jonah Williams because I think if you have Jonah Williams on your offensive line, bad things that happen are pretty much always his fault, uh, as someone who had him on my roster for four years. So, uh, yeah. That's that's that piece. But I, I do think things uh, look up for Will Hernandez. There's a lot of uh, reasons why he can have his best season he's had in probably the last handful of years. Uh, it's just a matter of things not falling apart completely for the Cardinals like they've had in previous years, whether it's a Kyler injury or otherwise. 
Deep Cut, another name you've heard from me before, but I'm going to keep pounding the table for this one. It's Kenyon Green. And it's all a matter of if he stays healthy for the Texans uh, and can solidify that left guard spot for them. He looked really good in the preseason, uh, getting to the second level, moving around better. looks like he's in better shape probably, again, just because he's now healthy. Uh, but lining up between Juice Scruggs at center and Laramie Tunsil, uh, that's that's a spot you want to be in. He was a top five graded guard overall in the preseason. Yeah, it's preseason, but this is also a young player, I think who's still 23 years old, who's just been hurt the last couple of years and hasn't been able to get his footing. He gets his feet under him. This is still, there's a reason he was the first guard taken in the draft overall a couple of years ago. The talent is all there. He just needs to stay healthy. And he flashed that talent still just this past month in August. It's not as if we were trying to see if he is still that same athlete or player that we loved in the pre draft process. Now that he's been injured for a few years, you saw that same player this past summer. So it's still there. It's just a matter of staying healthy on the field and then putting it all together. So that's my deep cut. Kenyon green. I'm not giving up on him. Yeah. If you go on the platform right now to try to pick him up on waivers, that grade will look horrible, but don't worry about it. Cause after week one, you're not seeing that previous season's grade on the homepage anyway. So, uh, this might be one you want to go for. Yeah. And it's just the Houston Texans offense is so mouthwateringly appetizing right like you just want to have as many bites of that apple as you can and i actually did it center as well as my deep cut in juice scruggs so juice scruggs uh beat out jared patterson this offseason for the starting center spot and he's somebody that we both liked when we were reviewing film uh last year as you know an incoming rookie but he was you know a little bit slow to start out and lost the starting job but he he played towards the end of the year and it wasn't great but it was you know starting level offensive line play. Uh, and now he, again, it's like, it's that full off season as the starter that I think is so valuable to these players that you're going to hear me talk about that a lot today, right? It's like the full off season is going to be fantastic for this guy. It's also, again, it's, it's, it's CJ Stroud with another year under his belt. It's Nico Collins gaining ground. It's the addition of Stefan Diggs. All of those things are, you know, start to piece together this, this monster of an offense that we all expect to come out uh, swinging this year in in Houston. So Juice Grubbs is my deep cut, but now for my under the radar guy, guy, I'm going in reverse a little bit here. And we have talked about him a lot too, and it's it's not that deep of a cut. But but Joe Titman this year is so exciting I for so it. many reasons. Uh, again, he wasn't the starter going into the season last year, so this year he gets a full off season to prepare. He finished last year with five of his last eight games in the green, which means, again, for five of the last eight games, he was better than average. And think about how his surroundings are going to change going into this year, right? Aaron Rodgers hopefully is healthy and can play the season. Uh, You get Tyron Smith as your left tackle. You want Elijah Vera Tucker to be healthy and back, which they're projecting he will. That itself, those three additions will make – Joe Titman's life so much easier. Remember, he was a rookie last year. This is year two with those additions with Aaron Rodgers behind the center. We talk about how veteran quarterbacks help out their offensive line and they can call things out pre-snap. And it just makes the life that much simpler for them. It slows it down for them. Joe Titman might feast this year. He might end up being center like two or three. Um, and we're talking about a guy that's probably going center eight to ten. Yeah, imagine going from Zach Wilson playing chess for you before the snap to Aaron Rodgers getting you lined up and ready to go instead. That is a massive difference, even if nothing else changes and a lot else is changing as, as, as you pointed out there. So um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of a layup, but I actually, uh, I had a long day today, right, Chris? So I read your text pretty fast and before realizing it, I also put a name down for center before I went to guard. So I just want to talk about it so it doesn't go to waste, but Aaron Brewer, goes to a friendlier scheme in Miami. Uh, and that same scheme saw 
Connor Williams become arguably the best center in the league before his injury, uh, his his second knee injury uh, over in Miami. So again, coming off a solid year at 26 years old, now heading to Miami. I know you don't like the offensive line as a whole in Miami. That's kind of been their Achilles heel and it eventually catches up to them on that offense. Uh, but when it comes to center, I think this is a good player in a good scheme now. And this is a good rebound from the loss of Connor Williams that they weren't expecting. So, uh, just wanted to shout that out as a, you want to call him a sleeper or a deep cut, but Aaron Brewer, I think uh, Arrow's pointing up for him in 2024. I like the call out. And I mean, it seems like Miami went and did some bargain bin shopping, right? To get the guys to replace some really good starters, right? Like I know Christian Wilkins leaving, they've replaced him with somebody too. I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but it's somebody that like, you could say the same thing that you just said about Aaron, uh, you know, the center that's coming in. It's like, it's a guy that, didn't do fantastic last year, but you could see a situation where the new, you know, situation and this coaching staff can get the most out of them. So I like that call out. Okay. I'm going to jump right into, or no, I need you to jump into defensive interior and tell me who you have. All right. I, I, I just got done saying they were going to get smoked at the start of this episode. Um, but Travis Jones, a lot of people kind of forgot about him. A lot of people liked him when he came into the league a few years ago, uh, as a defensive lineman, uh, kind of had the size, had the athleticism and was just kind of solid all around smart player. And he's just kind of been like waiting in the wings. Yes. He's got some playing time and had made some contributions. He's been a contributor, but hasn't been a, a player at the forefront of, of the Baltimore defense. But, uh, when you consider, uh, Justin Matabike and Michael Pierce, the Ravens, at least up front, have the ability to deploy their defensive interior players in situations that fit them best, such as you know Michael Pierce being just sort of a, a run game uh, specialist there on the interior. And Jones showed steady improvement in the pass rush and against the run uh, in year two, which was in 2023. So now he's heading into year three. Again, you kind of have that year three breakout timeline, still in a good organization uh, on a defense that loses some pieces. So he's probably going to be relied on a bit more, but they still have some threats on the edge there, like Adafi Owe, who kind of had a breakout late in the year last year. So uh, he's going to be relied on, but he's not going to have to shoulder too much of the load on the inside uh, uh, as a down lineman for that front. So I think, again, he's kind of got the right balance there of, of talent, development, and usage uh, not being too heavy for him in year three. To that end, and along those similar lines, my deep cut, again, it may sound like I'm just trying to plug this guy in whenever I can, but I'm going to go back to the rookie ranks again and plug in Jerzon Newton, also known as Johnny Newton. So I think the fact that you've got uh, Jonathan Allen and Daron Payne there actually might be what helps him the most because as a young player who is slightly undersized, you worry about someone like that wearing down with a high snap share in the NFL, especially as the season goes along. But given that defensive line that they have over there in Washington, he might be in that sweet spot of 20, 25 snaps per game in that defensive line rotation where he can be just the athletic pass rusher that he is and just be a disruptor and always be fresh for a spell and not drawing tough assignments or drawing double teams because he's not going to be the focal point that offenses are keying on. I think that's going to allow him to do what he does best while he's a young player. And again, probably avoid some of those pitfalls that you see with rookies, especially in the trenches as the year goes on with wearing down. So again, it's a deep cut. It's not a greater than 50, 50 chance here because we're talking about a young rookie defensive interior player, but there's a pathway for him to be a solid contributor, a high grader, and flash some of that talent that we see as early as year one. So this is a gamble I would take. I think those are both great call-outs, primarily because similar to a running back by committee, it's like you can get the most out of a player by playing to their strengths when they're young like that, right? And, and Justin Matabike is still in Baltimore, and so is uh, Michael Pierce. So they have other guys similar to like Washington, right? So they can rotate Travis Jones in when it makes sense. Same with, uh, you know, the situation in Washington. I have a guy like that that I'm also going to call out for edge, right? To start off edge as my under the radar pick. It's actually staying in Green Bay. It's Lucas Van Ness. And uh, if you are somebody that follows the Packers, one thing they do really well is they pick raw football players 
and they let them sit and learn and they season them so that by the time they're ready and they need them, they can step up in a big way. And if you watched Lucas Van Ness last year, he wasn't on the field all that much, right? And uh, for a first round pick, a lot of people are saying, wow, you could get more value with, with somebody ready to play. But what the Packers do is uh, let the guy sit. You look at what Rashawn Gary was able to become, and I think that's what happened to Lucas Van Ness. They put him in at times. He was successful in the limited role that he had, but with Preston Smith now getting a little bit older, I expect Lucas Van Ness's role to increase and the time that he's needed to increase. And again, he's a, he's a Green Bay Packer. That experience is going to come in now, another year under his belt, another year in the system. I like Lucas Van Ness's futures a lot. Um, and I think that he's somebody going really late in, in rookie drafts, or excuse me, in startup drafts. So you can probably get him pretty cheap. I was going to go with Odafe away literally because I got him in the 24th round of a draft recently. But I think after having an 80 grade, it's it's not really fair to go Odafe away. So I went with Lucas Van Ness. The guy I have for my deep cut, though, is Keon White in uh, New England. It was a really up and down rookie year for him, and he is an older prospect. So he's not somebody I typically would go to and say, hey, this guy's going to continue to ascend. But with the new coaching staff and when they traded Matt Judon, it told me that maybe they think Keon White can be the anchor edge rusher that they need. He can be the featured edge rusher in this system. I don't think there's anybody else there that can get that role, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I expect more snaps to come to him this year. Uh, the the defensive minded head coach, right? I know they had one before, and he was the best of all time. But this is a really good defensive coach as well. I expect Keon White's role to increase. He is a monster. He is a lunatic, right? I could I could see them playing into that lunatic style role. Say, hey, just go be a monster on the field. We're gonna we're gonna set you up for success. So he might be somebody to invest in. I don't know. I'm not. I was never a huge fan of Keon White, but I think the situation is just almost too perfect. I will hear your Keon White call out. I will never be on board with your Lucas Van Ness call out. I just, I just won't do it. Why is it's just, that? It's just I need to see him prove me wrong before I can just admit. I, I before I can admit it, and it's happened before. You know, people prove me wrong all the time uh, with with some of my pre-draft valuations. But I've never, I've never gotten the the sense that Van Ness has the twitch needed to really ascend in this league. Um, I've always felt he's kind of like a, a, a motor rusher, which is great. You, you know, you need players like that, but they're, they never ascend beyond a certain tier. And so for me, yeah, he probably, he might grade a bit better. He might get, you know, 67 ish or something like that, be past rusher 40 or something, but I don't, it, I, I, I don't see a high ceiling for him. Uh, but again, I could be wrong. And the Packers are typically that organization that will prove you wrong with how they develop their players over time. Uh, you forget about a certain player and then they go out there with their year three, year four breakout and prove you wrong for your takes that you had on them three years prior. So it absolutely could happen, but um, I will not give you that take. I will, I will not accept it. All right. So we'll have to wait and see, but I'm going to continue on with linebacker. Uh, and I, I cheated with linebacker pretty hard, actually. Like everybody um, cheats linebackers in this league. That's why I think great so poorly. <laughs> <laughs> Line and, downfield RPOs is just, yeah, poor linebacker. Well, well, the reason I did, the reason I did is because I think that there's a under the radar and a deep cut, and I honestly don't know which is which, but it's whichever linebacker for the Cowboys gets the most time. They, they've picked okay. fourth round pick linebackers in back-to-back -back years, I think maybe third round pick linebackers. In Maris Liafau. Liafau. Maris Liafau. That was pretty close. Come on, man. And, not, not even close. and Overshown, who was my guy last year. I loved that linebacker. And honestly, he was one of my top graded prospect linebackers in the last few years. I think he has that kind of talent. This preseason, he only played one game, which was preseason week one. It was an 87.5 grade in the snaps that he played. He looked fantastic. Rumor is he's good to go week one. They said there's not going to be a limit on what he's asked to do. But saying that, Marist got the nod as the starter so far in the unofficial depth chart. And he is somebody that I was I was a little less high on. I, I, I didn't love his tape. He's a little bit more of a limited skill set at linebacker, a uh, little bit more traditional old school linebacker. But, you know, I typically like that. Um, 
But when Jerry Jones, you called it out before, when Jerry Jones is invested in somebody, that guy usually gets the nod. And I, I expect Maris to get that early situation. Uh, but, I, but I expect Overshawn to be on the field consistently and kind of blow it up. So I don't know which one is going to be the deep cut and which one is going to be the under the radar. But those are two guys that I would roster any chance I can. So if one of them is a free agent in your league, go pick them up. If uh, somebody will, you know, take a seventh for one of them or maybe a sixth, I would say go do it and take the risk. Yeah, so the Cowboys went from last year pretty much having one healthy linebacker the whole year and having to play guys like Marquise Bell at linebacker who actually graded very well and played as well as he possibly could uh, to being pretty deep there under Mike Zimmer in kind of the more traditional style. What I think is going to happen is they're going to have uh, Eric Kendricks as kind of the vet um, – you know, be sort of the glue and the green dot guy on defense at linebacker. And they'll platoon Maris Leofau with him at on the field at the same time with, uh, you know, multiple box backers somewhat. But then on third downs and then just, uh, you know, some other spread sets, they're going to have DeMarvian Overshown out there as well. So I think you're going to get adequate playing time from both. And then as either the season goes on and definitely next year and beyond, you're going to see, Maris Leofau kind of take over that traditional Mike role. You're going to have Overshown on the outside. Damone Clark, I think both of these guys or all three of the guys we named have been good for Damone Clark as he's kind of a see ball, get ball guy, but in the traditional linebacker build mold mold as well. So they kind of turn that whole linebacker room around. I think those are both good call outs, but I think the higher ceiling there for sure, if you're looking at a potential breakout or difference maker, it's going to be overshown because he's also going to be sort of more of an athlete in space and not draw as tough of an assignment as someone like Marist may by being in the middle of the field in the box, he'll be working through more traffic than overshown will. And we've seen, I mean, the ceiling when overshown has been on the field, I mean, last year's preseason, he was fantastic before he got hurt, which was very early, but he had already made like three splash plays in like two defensive series. He looks good in training camp, looks good in the preseason. He's ready to go. So I think that's the, the sort of the high upside difference maker potential and Leo Fowles more so the potential or the future steady, consistent guy who you can start uh, every week once he sort of reaches that point in his career. Um, but you're not going to get the, the the sort of the breakout week to week upside that you will with a Demarvian Overshown. For sure, I'm I'm pumped about those guys, and I think there's a lot of people out there probably saying Henley in uh, Los Angeles with the Chargers and Trenton Simpson with Baltimore are also guys to keep an eye on. I just think that if somebody has them, they probably are a little bit more bought into their upside, and they might be a little bit more expensive. I also think Overshawn, in my opinion, was the better linebacker in tape in college, and he was the guy that I had higher than both of those guys. So I'm still bought in on him, and I think that uh, you know that's where my investment would go. But Ray, I just did two in a row. I want you to finish us, finish us off with uh, cornerback and safety. All right, cornerback uh, Joey Porter Jr. Sleeper? No, just kidding. I mean, he's if you can if I don't think he should be considered a sleeper. He's a basically a first round pick, thirty second overall. Had uh, some promising metrics. Uh, as a young player here, I think he's set to ascend clear number one corner in Pittsburgh. So we're not going to talk about that. Uh, I think everybody who has him is pretty well invested in him. But this may be a repeat guy. I'm not exactly sure. May have to go back to the archives last year. But Martin Emerson, uh, cornerback. So I think I might have called him out as a sleeper last year. Uh, but in 2023, he was second in the NFL in uh, percentage of targets caught against at just 47.1% actually behind only Joey Porter Jr. in that metric, by the way. Um, he's now just entering year three, which again is the traditional breakout year timeline. And he was good his rookie year, decent last year at a high variance position. I think it was around mid-60s. I should have wrote it down. Um, but I think last year could have really been the floor for Emerson, and he still showed kind of that that uh, sort of uh, ball hawking and kind of sticky uh, flash, if you will, by allowing such a low completion percentage uh, when targeted. So if last year was kind of a floor setting year for him and he looks very good in training or looked very good in training camp uh, this summer, he's got the size. He's he's a great athlete. I think it's only up from here, but don't start him like week one when they're going up against like CeeDee Lamb. Just, just throwing that out there too. Um, 
deep cut. It's probably more of a deep stash because nothing I say here I think is going to apply for this year for the most part. Uh, I don't have a Duran Bland for you this year. Sorry, like they, those don't come around every single year. Um, I, I had it last year, but but that's it. I'm, I'm all out of ammo there. Uh, but Max Melton, the cornerback uh, for the Cardinals, is an absolute stash, and I feel like he's just getting lost in all the talk around this rookie cornerback class. He hardly has talked about it at all, but he's he's looked good in camp against Marvin Harrison Jr. He's gone against him uh, every day for the past couple months here. He's athletic. He has all the tools. Both of the Meltons, uh, by the way, uh, Bo and Max, underrated athletes. Um, second round pick, 43rd overall, high draft capital, a great zone corner, but he shows man skills and athleticism. So he's got everything you need or want, and he's a young player uh, or in a young player. So while I don't think he's an every week starter, especially as a rookie, because the defense still needs an infusion of talent. They don't have a great pass rush and, and, you know, they're playing in a dome most, most weeks. And, you know, it's just, it, it's not conducive yet for a cornerback. There's no synergistic sort of factor on that defense for a cornerback. But I think when we look back on this rookie class, he could end up being one of the higher performers in the group when we look back three or four months from now uh, because all of the tools are there and he's just that kind of similar to the narrative around him, which has been none. He's just kind of a quiet, go about your business, get things done, perform well player. And that just doesn't get talked about, but it gets the job done. And so I think, again, we could look back and he could be one of the best performing rookies at corner in this class a year from now. Uh, but regardless, even if he's not, because again, that defense is so devoid of talent still for the most part, I'm holding on to Max Mellon for a couple of years and just seeing what develops there because there's no reason not to. This is not just a height, weight, speed guy that I'm hoping kind of can put things together. No, this is a football player with athleticism that I'm just waiting on everything else around him to kind of catch up if it doesn't hit right away. Okay. I mean, Barton Emerson is a good pick. You know, I, that cornerback room is just fantastic, right? With uh, Denzel Ward and Greg Newsome, it's like easy to be a third guy and you can match up so well when you have that kind of depth. I think the almost the exact opposite is true for Max Melton, which is my biggest concern for him is that he's going to be in a situation where they might ask him to do everything. And I don't really think he was that type of corner going into the draft where he can go out there and uh, just match up against anybody, right? Yes, he's a great athlete, but um, I think he might be better set to go against some of the bigger receivers in the league. And I think he might struggle with some of the more twitch, twitched up guys. Um, but I'm excited to see it. Who do you have at safety? Safety is just one guy. He's kind of a sleeper and a deep cut at the same time. Okay. And that's Wanya Thomas. I think we talked about him during the safety episode. Um, but Mike Zimmer has a very safety friendly scheme. Doesn't often ask them to play single high and just kind of, uh, you know, go from the opposite hash. Uh, but Wanya Thomas is a complete do it all player who I think takes snaps away from Donovan Wilson this season. Honestly, based on their performances this summer, it should already happen or is kind of already happening. Um, but I think if you just watch Wanya Thomas, A, when his, in his only snap and his only start last year, I think he was like one of the highest graders of the week at safety position uh, as a whole. Then when uh, the rest of that defense got healthy, he kind of resumed a reserve third safety type role. But when you watch him, he can cover from the opposite hash or he can uh, come up and really thump you in the run game. He's a decent blitzer, actually. Uh, he's a complete player that hasn't gotten that stability of a full starting role just yet. But when he's been on the field, he's sort of gotten the job done. And it's almost as if you kind of wonder with like two coaching staffs now, is it is it something where uh, like he's one of those players when he's on the field, it looks great, but you wonder like, hey, is he maybe just a better game player than he is a practice player? Uh, because when he's on the field, it's great, but he just doesn't seem to completely earn the trust of the coaches. Could just be young player type of problems, and he eventually gets there. But I think that's what kind of keeps him back from really being this uh, surefire starter who's going to play 45, 50-plus snaps per game on defense at the safety position. 
But if he plays himself into that role, and again, I think he may have already done that, but we'll have to see how it shakes out because the Cowboys are pretty deep at safety, actually, between Marquise Bell, Malik Hooker, Donovan Wilson, and Wanye Thomas. They can roll pretty deep at that spot. So uh, again, depending on the volume that he gets and how stable his role is, I think he can be a top 20 safety in the league, quite honestly, in 2024. It's just a matter of can he break through a deep room? Because if he does, he has the athleticism to really take off. Okay. I get. I, I don't know much about him, so I'll have to watch and see. People have tried have... to ask for a lot in trades for him. Like, There's certain people that are hip to it and know that I'm kind of hip to it and have asked for a lot in return for Wanya. And I'm like, look, it's it's great, but I can't do it. But um, wow. he might be available on your waiver wire. I would say he's definitely worth like a you know player fifty two or fifty three on your roster. Say okay, I might save your butt though because I had a safety in mind. Um, Jamie what Robinson, save my butt like I just fell on my butt or something. You just gotta you know. You only had one. You know. Yeah, but he kind of covered both roles. Kind of covered both roles. I don't like it, man. Jamie Robinson okay. in Carolina, uh, second year from FSU. He was a prospect that I really liked last draft. It was a very weak safety class, uh, but he was a guy that kind of stood out as uh, a guy that I thought could fit the opportunity and end up maybe ascending. And I think that he had a pretty promising rookie season, and that defense is going to be so void of talent this year that they're going to be looking for guys to step up and really take the reins. If J.C. Horn can be healthy this year, I think that cornerback one spot will be secure, but I think they need a safety that's going to step up and be kind of the saving grace for that back end. And I think Jamie Robinson can be that, right? They still have Derek Brown on the inside. They drafted a linebacker, but they they need that defensive back group to really step up. And Jamie Robinson's going to have to be a, a leader in that room. What do you think of him? I think he's fine. Um, I think he's someone that kind of plays to the level of, uh, of his surroundings. Um, I think he's a slight value add player. That's, that's kind of what I recall of him joining or, or entering the league. Um, Carol, you know, th- that defense is still pretty underrated. So I think in that aspect, this is an under the radar type of guy. And again, we're talking safety. There's not a lot of great certain type of players out there. There just isn't. So I think he has a good shot as any. And I think the more I talk about it, probably better than that. Uh, again, given kind of his his surroundings and what he's done to date and how he looked coming into the league. But yeah, he's someone that uh, when when things are, are are solid around him and he's able to get to the football and not have to compensate elsewhere uh, for shortcomings in the defense, he can make plays. So yeah, I think I think it's it's key when you point out the health and 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 uh, availability of some of that talent in front of him. So that allows him from the back end to, to sort of be that playmaker uh, to kind of put the cherry on top of that defense. So yeah, I, th- I think it's incumbent on his surroundings, but he can be that guy. Okay. Awesome. We appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, if you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at all 22 underscore PFF and give us a review wherever you watch or listen to your podcast and have a great night guys. Enjoy Thursday. Wow, you faked me out.